Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Salone d'Onore of La Triennale di Milano. My name is Marco San Micheli. I'm the, the International Relations Chief Officer of this institution. And in relation to um, the 22nd International Exhibition, I take care and coordinate the international participation. It's my honor to introduce this uh, conversation, this talk, and I bring the, the greetings on behalf of the President of Triennale di Milano, Professor Stefano Boeri. Um, sound, science, and nature getting together in the museum space is the title of this uh, upcoming conversation. And it's my honor to introduce quite briefly the outstanding profiles of our guests. It's important for me and for our institution to start uh, greeting and welcoming you in Triennale. Uh, Bernie Krauss, thank you very much for coming and for being with us this afternoon and thank you for, to you and to uh, Fondation Carte Pular Contemporain to uh, have the Great Animal Orchestra as part of Broken Nature Design Takes on Human Survival. Bernie Krauss began studying music at the age of four. From 1964, he formed a pioneering duo with musician Paul Beaver and collaborated with some of the big names of the music industry and the film world. In 1970, the team released an album on the theme of ecology in a wild sanctuary, fusing, fusing natural soundscapes with electronic music for the first time. From that point on, Bernie Krause became passionate about making sound recordings of our wild ecosystems and the animal species inhabited, inhabiting them. He was awarded a PhD in bioacoustics in 1981, at which point he decided to travel the world making recordings in what was left of the planet wilderness. He has since built an outstanding collection of soundscapes and observes then more than 50% of the habitats included in, the, in this collection have today disappeared as wild habitats due to human activities and the consequential ecological loss. Bernie Krause developed the concept of biophony based on the relationship between each living being and the complete biological soundscape of its habitat. With Bernie Krause, the recording of natural sounds known as bioacoustics has become an incredibly effective instrument for observing changes in the world's remaining wild habitats. It helped lay the foundations of a new scientific discipline, soundscape ecology. Bernie Krause archives these soundscapes so then they may, they may be passed on to the future generations. In the case, the great animal orchestra should eventually fall silent one day. But Bernie Krause is also here on stage with other guests and researchers. Let me introduce you to Nadia Pieretti. She received her, she received her PhD environmental, in environmental science at the University of Urbino in 2012 and obtained a post-PhD fellowship at the Laboratory of Soundscape Ecology at the same university from 2012 to 2015. Among many achievements, she's been awarded L'Oreal UNESCO Woman in Science 2015 Italy with a research grant. From 2013 to date, she collaborates with the Polytechnic University of Marche for the analysis of biological sounds in marine environments and the assessment of the impact of human activities on them. Since 2017, she's lecturer at the Polytechnic, Polytechnic University of Marche. Then we have Almo Farina, which is one of the most important researchers and representative on ecoacoustics in the world is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Ecoacoustics, director of the International Institute of Ecoacoustics, and president of the International Society of Ecoacoustics. Moderating this panel is uh, uh, Grazia Quaroni, director of the collections of Fondation Cartier Poulard Contemporaine in Paris. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Thank you, Marco, and thank you very much to, the, to, to be here today around Bernie Krauss and around the Great Animal Orchestra, the installation that is part of Broken Nature and we can visit later on. 
I would like to thank uh, the Triennale and its president, Stefano Boeri, for uh, welcoming us. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Paola Antonelli, who is Design Senior Curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Curator of Broken Nature, uh, to have uh, strongly uh, desired to have uh, the Great Animal Orchestra in her project, and uh, uh, a special thanks to the wonderful team of the Triennale. We have on the public today Hervé Chandès, who is the General Director of the Fondation Cartier, who initiated the, the Great Animal Orchestra project, along with uh, Thomas de Lamar, curator at the Fondation Cartier. And we will terribly miss Matthew Clark from United Visual Artists, who, as, uh, who is one of the authors with Bernie Krauss of the Great Animal Orchestra, but we're gonna try to involve him anyway in the discussion. Uh, the Great Animal Orchestra has been created in 2016 at the initiative of Fondation Cartier in Paris, and today it's part of its collection. For, uh, it started for an exhibition called The Great Animal Orchestra, a title that has been kindly offered as a gift by Bernie Krauss to the Fondation Cartier because Bernie wrote a book with this title, and uh, which is still really seminal for uh, eco-acoustics and uh, the Great Animal Orchestra installation is a real applica visual application of uh, the principles that Bernie explained in the book. The installation is a part of the collection, so it means that uh, it can travel around the world. It has been in Paris, in uh, South Korea, in Shanghai, in Milano, and very soon, we can see it in London at the beginning of October at uh, 180 Strand. Thank you for Sean Bieder to be here today. It's gonna be the next uh, occasion in Europe to see the Great Animal Orchestra. And in, uh, in London, it's gonna be part of a solo show of United Visual Artists. This project is actually one step of a long series of exhibitions uh, and commissions uh, that since the 90s are uh, uh, identifying the Cartier Foundation as uh, uh, engaged in significant issues which are related to the most important uh, subject uh, of, uh, mm, of our time, nature and environment, climate change and its impact on migrations, humans' relationship to the animal and vegetal world, deforestation and the disappearance of indigenous language and culture. Uh, they have been developed through collaboration with the artists and science that form today around the Fondation Cartier a solid community. And these projects put people together, first of all, and people from very different fields of creation. And uh, the Great Animal Orchestra is totally on this move. And this move will continue with the next exhibition opening in July in Paris at the Fondation Cartier, and it will be around trees, uh, trees and uh, uh, vegetal intelligence. And we will find back uh, in the exhibition some friends you already met in Broken Nature, like for example, Stefano Mancuso, Manuele Koch, and many others. But we have the chance to have uh, Bernie Krauss with us today, and so I think it's better to hear him to talk about the genesis of this work his uh, incredible background of music and cinema, about his 50 years recording 5,000 hours in, the, in different forests all around the world, until uh, uh, the meeting with Hervé Chandès and uh, Matthew Clark from UVA, and the birth of uh, the Great Animal Orchestra installation that you can see today in Broken Nature and we can visit all together after the, after the talk. Uh, so, Bernie, how the Great Animal Orchestra installation was born? Well, it was born with a book and the book was the Great Animal Orchestra which came out uh, and was published in 2012. Uh, somehow the book got to Hervé Chandez uh, who called me and asked if he could meet. Came to California uh, in 2014, and we had a long week in the studio going over lots of material related to the book. And we decided that maybe there was a way to put this together so that we could use scientific data and transform it into a work of art. And it was really uh, Hervé's uh, vision 
and uh, Thomas de la Mar's vision, who also worked with Hervé on this and uh, came to California as well. Uh, we went over a lot of material. We decided on seven different habitats that were under stress at the time, now gone pretty much. Um, and we included those, uh, worked on those to make them just right in terms of performance, which you'll see in the exhibit. We also, it was also very important to us to use sound as the major medium uh, through which we were going to express this work and to use the visual aspect, which is usually turned around uh, the opposite way, uh, as a supporting element to the sound rather than like we usually do in film and video where we take the, uh, we do the visual first and then we always add the sound. So this is the other way around. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a piece also without a lot of narrative to it, uh, a lot of words and, and explanation. And really, the natural soundscape speaks for itself. If you listen to it and you become involved in the way that it's expressed with the images on the screen, you understand immediately what's taking place and what's inherent in that narrative. And so we created this piece. Uh, uh, certainly, UVA was very much a part of that because the spectrograms that uh, this is Matt uh, Ward, uh, Matt, I'm sorry, I forgot his last name. Matt. Matt Clark. Matt Clark, thank you. I'm losing it. Um, anyway, Matt Clark uh, was uh, very much involved in this process because the spectrograms that I had and was using on my computer were very limited in scope and they weren't, they, they, they were very focused and narrow. And we needed something that was m on a much larger scale like this you see on the screen now. So uh, UVA was called into the picture because they're specialists in this field and they created the imagery that you'll see that supports the soundscapes that I've created. And I think it's a very important element and important to know that um, we're in a period of serious crisis and we have very little time to deal with that. And one of the things that we need to do is, as scientists here on the stage, certainly, and uh, people that I'm working with right now, is try to find ways to get this information that we work on so hard and publish, and only five or 10 people read it. We need to get this out to a larger audience, a much larger audience. And we need to reach people emotionally and at any level that we can. And what's neat about these soundscapes is that it speaks to people across all cultures, so it's not culturally biased, and also that the soundscapes um, uh, reach people of all ages. So I can bring a, f a group of five-year-olds into this exhibit, as well as a group of 80-year-olds. So that's why I'm really so happy to be part of this, uh, this team, and it is a team effort. Uh, it's the Fondation Cartier, it's UVA, and, uh, and even the people here who have, in, who have installed this exhibit. I am grateful. Thank you, Bernie. Um, so uh, the Great Animal Orchestra is actually the combination of sound and visual uh, that's getting together. And I think that since Matt is not here today, we don't have any presence of UVA. I just prepared a couple of quotes that seem very simple uh, to me to, to understand exactly how sound and uh, visual could get together in your particular case. Because listening to Bernie's recordings, Matt said, Matt thought it, it would have been interesting to create an environment that immerses the audience visually. So we create an environment. And uh, and immerses the audience visually. So he designed, it's his word, uh, a software, al software algorithm to represent the soundscape through light so to better understand what you are hearing. So the attention is still concentrated on sound, but uh, the visual will help to get into sound. And what Matt says is, 
the installation wouldn't have any visual composition if it wasn't for the sound driving it. So the subject is sound, and the construction around will make the sound readable somehow, visual. visual. So it's kind of synesthetic process that uh, uh, can really expand the, uh, the action of sound in, uh, in a more complete and a more immersive experience. And again, Matt Clark, when you see the recordings through spectrograms and spend time just meditating on them, you start to think about the relationship between the natural world and perhaps the origins of art, the origins of music, which I think is one of the subjects that in interests a lot, Bernie, and it's actually the heart of both your work and uh, United Visual Artists' work. Yeah, the, uh, the book, The Great Animal Orchestra, is really the story of how animals taught us to dance and sing. And when we first, when we were living closely connected to the natural world, we had a connection with every aspect of that natural environment. Uh, we, did, we never had a word for ourselves as musicians or artists or really anything that described us other than being connected to the natural world. And we didn't call it nature because nature is out there and we're here and we're different. So I had to find a way to connect, reconnect us back again. And it was really through the message of soundscapes that... For me, as a composer, originally as a composer and a professional musician, I found that link. Um, I found that there were groups, again, connected to the natural world, like the Hivaro in the Amazon, or the Yanomami uh, in the upper Brazilian, uh, in northern part of Brazil, or the Kalali in Papua New Guinea, or the Bayaka in the Central African Republic. All of these groups, um, uh, when they perform their music, um, use the, the sounds of the forest as a natural karaoke orchestra with which they perform. So it's their backup band. So when they want to go out and they want to sing, they want to do karaoke, they always do it to the natural soundscape because that's their band, that's their music. Um, so that's kind of where we got it. And uh, we learned to sing in relationship to those um, soundscapes and the, those biophonies that were present in the forest. What happens when a habitat is healthy is each of the, or, each of the vocal organisms tends to find a uh, bandwidth for itself that is unique to that particular species or animal at that particular moment in time. It's like changing channels on a, on a, on a, a television set. Uh, you change it to channel four, and you get insects, you change it to channel three and you get birds, you change it to another channel, you get mammals. And when they all play together, it's a very rich element of, of, uh, of confirmation. Uh, and it's almost like a symphony orchestra. If you take a look at a spectrogram, it looks very much to me as a composer, like uh, a score perhaps by Boulez, a uh, 20th century score. So these things have relationships to one another, and it was very much part of my work to uh, discover this for myself and then to begin to tell other people about how the natural soundscape was working in the world and what we might do to pay some attention to it. Thank you, Bernie. I go back to, Ma, to Matt, saying that the work deals with both aesthetics and scientific issues simultaneously. And this is a this is really something we can't guarantee. Uh, we have uh, eco-acousticians around us, uh, and uh, uh, it's really a way to, uh, uh, let's say, enlarge, magnify the, the best aspect of science, which is creativity, in a very open way. Matt says it's a space for contemplation, and in space in which the architecture the people and the work coexist to create the experience together, the famous immersive experience. And now today we have 
with us two Italian eco-acousticians, friends of Burning Tower since a long time, Almo Farina, Nadia Perietti. And with their presence, they witness of the vitality of eco-acoustics in Italy, first of all. And, uh, and they also will let us know not only the voice of the scientist, uh, but also the passion of the man and the woman. That's what we like in the fact of bringing science in the museums, actually. Every time we brought science in the museum and the, in the Cartier Foundation and, or, and in the museums around the world, creativity of science has been relieved. And it has been very easy to, uh, to, to approach. So I would like now to, to hear from Almo Farina reacting on Bernie's words uh, reacting on Bernie's installation, and uh, from a scientific point of view, Almo, do you think that an installation like the Great Animal Orchestra is able to demonstrate the importance of uh, animal sounds and acoustic information? Thanks for your question. First of all, I have many friends in this world, and so I'm very happy. Secondly, I have to thank your kind invitation, your foundation. I think that um, <clears throat> Bernie approach is uh, absolutely in important, interesting, and uh, I think that the word orchestra, my question is, who is the director of such an orchestra? In my idea is that the director is the evolution. Evolution is moving the orchestra, the animal orchestra. And this is extremely important from my point of view, because every animal, every soniferous animal, uh, has made a, a, a small trail to understand much better the environment, to perceive much better the environment, and to communicate each other about this environment. So I think that uh, the idea of Bernie to rep represent uh, not only sound uh, from our point of view, but also visual, from a visual point of view, you can imagine that when a spectrogram is projected, you see like a forest. And more complex is the forest, more type, types of, of, of sounds are produced. Of course, it's an algorithm, it's an artificial vision of the sound, because a spectrogram is a, artifact is a, an algorithm but but is uh, extraordinary to see that the more this forest is high is tall more branches you have and more uh, not animal but more uh, in individual performance are there this is very important so we have not confound the richness of the environment and the richness of spectrogram, because in some part of the world, like in Europe, there are animals that create very complex spectrograms. And this depends by the fact that here, there are less, less organisms that in the evolutionary time have expanded their capacity to speak much better. In other areas, like in tropical, animals have been obliged to stay in a very narrow band, but exactly the two opposite um, configuration are, ex are an example of the complexity of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of such phenomenon. And uh, uh, Almo, what is the role of sound of biological origins? Of course, the, the, the role of sound first, communicate, like now, we are speaking each other, you are hearing us, and communicate. And why to communicate? This is a very good question. And organisms try to communicate each other to save time, to save, to save energy. And this is the basis of the biosemiotics. We are communicate to save energy, time, and often it's like uh, using telephone, cell telephone. We are calling. More you spend time at telephone, less time you spend driving. Because we've called, no, it's not true, sorry. 
is a wrong example. <laughs> we, people both more driver, more driving, and more calling. Anyway, so uh, the role of sound is uh, amazing. To communicate each other, to navigate, to navigate walls, uh, um, uh, beds, use uh, ultrasounds, and etc. to navigate, to, to recreate a mental map, a cognitive map of a surrounding using sound, like a sonar. People, you say, military has invented sonar. No, the sonar has been invented by anyone. Anyway, and this to navigate, and also to select the habitat. Extremely important, this goal, uh, selecting the habitat. I select this habitat. When you try to rent or to buy a, a house in a city, you select the, the area in which the noise is low and the cost of the houses depends by the noise level. So, habitats, another function, and, and so on. There are more, many, many other functions, but this is important. Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that I think about with uh, these animals and their vocalizations is uh, they're describing a sense of place. And they're also describing uh, the, the health of that habitat. Like when we're sick, we have, we, our voice changes and, and it feels different. When a habitat is under stress and it's sick, its voice changes, and we can actually measure that and hear that now. Yeah. And one of the ways that we do that is by looking at spectrograms yeah. and seeing that. The, 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 the quality of the, the, the sound, the songs, calls, are honest signal. That means that when you are in good condition, Thank you. Uh, yes, you, you, you speak much better. I, I, I'm used to, 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 to take some medicine for my problem of health. And when I take one type of medicine, my, vocal, my, my voice is lower. And this is an indication that something is, is more wrong in my body. And the same for animals that are under, without food or without refugees or are stressed, the, 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 the acoustic performance are reduced or changed or uh, adapted uh, differently. So it depends. There are so many cases. And actually, Bernie, uh, I remember you telling me once that sometimes there are some operations uh, on the forest, for example, that, uh, uh, that are based on the idea that the aspect of the forest does not change, but actually the sound changes in terms of deforestation, for example. And uh, we have plenty of examples of that. Some of them are shown in this exhibit. And what we want to describe, again, it's, it's, but those are kind of extremes where we've clear cut a habitat and there are absolutely no animals living there anymore. Uh, or we do some kinds of things to a, uh, uh, um, a terrestrial habitat where we're not clear cutting, but where we're taking out doing what's called selective logging, taking out a tree here or there. And it changes certain components of that habitat, the acoustics of the habitat, for instance. And so then the structure, the bioacoustic structure of that particular habitat will change. Um, the, uh, I just, uh, not only that, but we're looking at, at coral reefs. And because of ocean acidification and global warming, and uh, pollution, the coral reefs are changing radically. And we have an example in the exhibit of a coral reef that's, that's living uh, on one side of it. And we, we hear 11 species of fish. Fish actually make sound, by the way. Uh, we hear 11 species of fish on a coral, on part of the coral reef that is uh, living and viable. And then 400 meters away, the reef is dying and it's bleached. And the, the difference between the living and the dying coral reef is palpable. I mean, we really can hear it. It, 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 it causes an emotional reaction when we hear the difference side by side. Now, uh, 
we're going to try to know more and to better define what is ecoacoustics. Uh, now, I, I would like to invite uh, Nadia Peretti to, to explain us what, when, when, when you want to study ecoacoustics, for example, what, what are you actually facing? Which are the stages you have to go through to embrace the discipline and what is exactly the subject? There are, there are many specialists between the public, but there's also some young people who may, may have new ideas tonight. So would you like to introduce us the ecoacoustics, uh, which is a, a, the common point of all people around us tonight? Of course, with pleasure. Thank you, Grazia, and thank you to all the audience that had the pleasure to come here today. Ecoacoustics actually is a new brand of the ecology, let's say. It's a, a brand new re research field in which we study the sounds coming from the environment in order to understand the well-being of animal community. Um, actually, I have... Uh, um, prepared a presentation that talks about it. You're very welcome. <laughs> Basically, what I would like to do with this presentation into, is to introduce you into this world of the work we are doing. So, what does the ecoacoustician do for understanding the well-being of animal communities and how listening to the nature can, uh, uh, can give to the scientists a lot of information about the health state of environment? First of all, I need to remind what already uh, Bernie and Almo suggested to us, that biological sounds are intrinsic elements of the ecosystem. You probably are well aware about the sounds produced by birds, by mammals, by anurans, but, or even by bats. But um, uh, just a few of us probably know that even fishes produce sounds, even crustaceans produce sounds, even sea urchins. So let's imagine the vastity and the quantity of animals which are producing sounds in our environment. And they do it intentionally most of the time. In particular, these sounds are considered as crucial for a number of ecological functions. The first of all, we have defined it to be communication. Then they are useful for defending a territory, or for choosing a mating partner, or to seek out for a prey or a predator. Sometimes the sounds are used also in a passive way, not just in an active way, the sound production, but in a perception way. Let's think about all the animals that need to, to perceive all the biological or non-biological sources about the environment surrounding them in order to understand which is their best path to follow for survival. So producing sound is not something that occurs casually, randomly. It's something really linked to these ecological functions. And animals do invest even some energy in order to produce them. So they are very important for the life of the animals instead, indeed. These sounds, since they are linked to these ecological functions, they are also linked to specific hours of the day in which these behaviors occur. Basically, we used to say that during the day, we have a sort of circadian rhythm with pitches at dawn and at dusk of a high biophony activity. And with biophony, we refer to the definition of Bernie, all the sounds produced by mm, animals. There is also a seasonal variation. We have higher sound production by the animals during spring because it's linked to the reproductive season and during fall. All this repetition of this uh, oscillation of up and down so, and shift of sounds should repeat identical year after year if environmental change is not occurring. 
but we know very well that this is not happening. We are producing, we are introducing into the environment a lot of different impacts. Human activities are causing a deep stress into our environments and animal communities. What data show us is that we have a very enormous decline of animal populations. The Living Planet Index in 2018, uh, uh, written by the WWF, showed us that we have the 60% uh, of the vertebrate population less in comparison of 1970. And extinction rates are rising and rising, especially in, in uh, recent years. So we have less animals and we have less species. All this comes to a great silence. Less species, less animals. So all these sounds that were produced before now are gone. They are not present anymore into our, into our environment. And so a great silence is spreading over the natural world, even as the sound of the man is becoming deafening. So on a side, we have less biological sounds. On the other side, instead, we have a lot of noise pro uh, pollution that we are introducing into the environment. So how all this information can be in some way interpreted in order to understand the well-being of animal communities or when it's time to act for conservation or preservation action. What ecoacoustics do in their job is to place recorders unattended into the field, both in marine or in terrestrial environments. We call it the passive acoustic monitoring. Passive be because the technician doesn't need to be there into the field. And we can collect in this way uh, several days, weeks, or even months, or even years of acoustic data that successively we elaborate into the lab with a specifically built acoustic software. What we use at first to interpret this data is the spectrogram. The spectrogram is the representation of the sound along time and frequency. This defines the acoustic space in which all species produce their sound. So you can see, for example, at the top of the spectrogram, some bat is singing here, is echolocating, and uh, these are high, uh, uh, high pitch frequency sounds. And in the, top of the, uh, in the bottom of the spectrum, we have instead some birds with the low frequency sounds. So uh, the first idea, looking at uh, uh, this spectrum that was, uh, that, is, that is the result of the representation of an animal community in Zimbabwe taken by Berni several years ago, is that we immediately can uh, perceive that every single sound, every single animal can be immediately identified separately, one to another. There's no overlap. There's no masking one each other. And this leads to the Nietzsche hypothesis theory always performed for the first time by Krauss in 1993, in which it states species singing in the same area and at the same time face the risk of mutual masking interference. Acoustic space is something that needs to be shared by competitive singing species. Because let's think, if we are all speaking all together, probably our message is not going to arrive to the receiver. Instead, if we organize inside this acoustic space, or in time, or in frequency, uh, to not overlap one another, we are going to uh, maximize the result of our investment of energy in producing sound. So this leads to the great animal orchestra, this beautiful thought that animals are like instruments of an orchestra in which each one has his own frequency, each one has his own rhythm, each one has his own voice. So you can see every listener of that sound can immediately understand when a single species is starting or ending to sing and, when, uh, it and where it is located. So all this information about the soundscape and about the uh, presence and absence of the sounds a long time and a long frequencies can provide us very useful information about uh, the, the species living in the environment. So acoustic, temporal, and spectral changes can tell us a very interesting story. First of all, the first information we might have from the analysis of the spectrogram 
is to understand which species are present in the environment, so we can have a sort of checklist of the species which produce the sound, and every single sound corresponds a different species. Sometimes this uh, is very useful, especially in remote environments when uh, um, the availability of expert field technicians is not uh, so uh, uh, advanced to permit them to go into the field uh, every month, for example, to have uh, a biodiversity um, monitoring. But with the recorders, we can just leave the recorder there and obtain the, this, the same results over months or even over years. Sometimes it can even happen that we can record a species that doesn't correspond to any single uh, classified species. So probably this is going to be or a new species or a species which we don't know yet the sound produced. So going deeper into the analysis, once we know the species present into the environment, we can hear how the sounds are produced. So are they many, are they few, are they made differently with different frequencies or at different time of the day. This tells us a lot about the stressful con condition about the animal, about the abundance of the individuals present in the environment, and if I cannot hear anymore a particular sound that was there previously, probably the animal is going to uh, uh, dislocate in another environment, or maybe if it happens in um, a varied uh, region and in a varied uh, number of years, maybe we could suggest even extinction. Sounds can be also very powerful indicators of ecosystem degradation. We have said just now that species react with songs with a different production of sounds uh, to stressful situations, like, for example, chemical pollution. Sometimes, so, we even hear changes before we can see them. Because if we go into the environment, we still found the same species as before. But probably they are not going to be okay anyway, because for example, the humid area is polluted by chemical pollution. And so, through the medium of sounds, it's a sort of uh, an alarm that uh, advise us that something is occurring and something needs to be done. When we listen to our acoustic files, unfortunately, we always need to face some noise pollution. Noise pollution is a worldwide problem, which is causing a lot of interference for animal communication, both in terrestrial and marine environments. Let's think about communicated, communicating in an airport or at the train station. It's going to be difficult, not just for us, but also for the animal. And since the sound's production is a crucial living phase of their life, this is going to impede a lot of ecological functions as well. Finally, last but not least, sounds can be very useful in tracking changes over time of animal communities. Here I have listed all the major threats to biodiversity, which are climatic changes, loss of habitat, overexploitation, pollution, and etc. All these threats are producing changes year after year uh, in a very fast way. So we need a sort of medium in order to understand immediately when this is occurring and to uh, decide to change direction or to, in some way, um, uh, advance some actions in order to uh, not miss uh, some other species. So if we start recording today into an environment and we discover which is the baseline layer of all these oscillations day by day, season by season, we can discover which is the rhythm of that community. Probably, like we said, all of these impacts are going to change it. And so the sounds can be a sort of measure which make us immediately understand uh, when the, uh, the alteration is going to be harmful to the animal. Finally, I would like to propose you an invitation, the invitation that Richard Murray Schaefer did in the Tanning of the World, his book. Uh, Richard Murray Schaefer was one of the first scientists who discovered, who, who, who talked about the soundscape, which are the sounds of the landscape. In this book, he invited the readers to try to hear the acoustic environment as a musical composition. 
and to think, to remember well, that we are the producer of this musical composition and we own responsibility for these compositions. So I invite you today or the next days where you are in the road along Milan or at your house to hear your acoustic environment and ask yourself, do you like what you hear? Do you like this musical composition? Would you like it to be better? And to start practicing, we have already here the, uh, the great animal orchestra installation in which you have the unique opportunity to listen to sounds all over the world, here all over, coming from all over the world, here in Milan, and to see the perfect uh, model of Mother Nature in which the sound uh, puzzles together in a perfect composition meticulously detailed and to see also the effect of the human activity on this kind of sounds and the effect of it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, we can really feel that it's a wonderful discipline, first of all, and that the work uh, by Bernie Krauss and UVA are totally into it. Are totally into it, yes. Inspired a lot of research. And, uh, well, there are some elements that are very, very evident. I took some notes during your, uh, your presentation. The decrease of uh, animal population is extremely explicit into the, the great animal orchestra. Uh, the before and after maps uh, are, very, uh, are very explicit. Um, probably we have to, one thing we didn't do is to describe what's inside the, the installation. There are three uh, major moments actually, which are different. Well, there's first of all the introduction where I kind of introduced the ideas of how I got to this uh, point. And the second is the habitats, the three or four habitats that have changed radically over time as a result of human uh, endeavor. Um, as I said, there's a coral reef, there's a clear-cut habitat, there's a, um, there's a habitat that is um, uh, uh, selectively logged, and there's another one as well, uh, Costa Rica before and after. Anyway, there are four habitats which really show how this work can be used. And finally, there are just the, the seven different um, habitat, long versions of the habitats, that most of which now are gone um, and in a very short period of time. I want to point out that I have an archive that's that has a little over 5,000 hours of material from 1,100 different kinds of habitats, deserts and high mountain, uh, low altitude range uh, near the ocean. Um, I mean, all kinds of habitats, uh, Arctic and Antarctic, subarctic, subtropical, and so on. So I have a, a, a lot of material collected over the years as whole, as, uh, as whole soundscapes. Uh, because I was really interested in the holistic sound that was produced by the collective voices of all of these animals. So it's a very rare habitat. It's, it's, uh, uh, and, but what I, what I miss most of all now is that fully 50% of what I've recorded in the last 50 years comes from places that no longer exist. And uh, that to me is a wake-up call um, and something that Nadia said her uh, presentation uh, points to the issue, you know, what do we do about this? How do we address it? Well, we need some answers, and we're looking. Um, so we are into the broken nature subject, uh, uh, all in that, uh, with a lot of hope, anyway. I uh, There's just one part of the installation. So the installation is made out of uh, seven different soundscapes, four different soundscapes with, that show the before and after moment, and one portrait, a, a film portrait by uh, French filmmaker Raymond de Pardon of Bernie Krauss, which is extremely interesting and intense in uh, the message and, uh, uh, and the image. Um, so now, 
Almo, do you have uh, uh, any reaction on the presentation of Nadia? Uh, is there any point that the, by the, the eco-acoustics you are uh, feel that need to complete the presentation? No, of course I am in accordance with Nadia. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, it's important to stress about role of sound ecology, uh, for instance, track records, research records is extremely important. When you introduce a new species in one area that is unknown by this species, this species are very, species, I mean animals, of course, these species often have scanty, uh, um, scanty probabilities to, uh, to settle, to to survive because it doesn't understand the language of the, the habitat. So it's exactly when a migrant arrives, for instance, in, in Italy, they don't have knowledge about uh, our language. So many difficulties there, uh, it's uh, spreading. So I think that uh, uh, sound is necessary also for, for, for foraging and often species, wood, wood communities, uh, there are interspecific uh, capacity to understanding each other and to use uh, the strategy of other species to, to intercept, uh, intercept uh, food. And this is extremely important. So it's not by chance that in hybrid nature, like uh, uh, this term is not uh, usual, usual in ecology, but hybrid means a mixture between human activity and uh, the environment, that uh, in such hybrid uh, conditions, uh, some species are um, advantages because they recognize uh, um, immediately uh, as, 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 um, um, in terms of meaning of the information that is coming from the environment. They translate immediately the information from the nature in meaning. Meaning is extremely important to uh, say, oh, this is, uh, this is, uh, has a meaning that I know the function. Without meaning, no information is, can be, uh, uh, can be uh, 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 utilized. So my reflection is, uh, require more time, but I think that people, <laughs> some people can understand my word because there are some ecologists, but I, I am not a, um, say a speaker for a large audience, so I'm, I apologize for others that are not ecologists in my speech. Okay. Bernie, the, the <laughs> word of the end. Écoute. Écoute, eh? Écoute. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to Bernie Krauss, Almo Farina, and Nadia Pierre. Thank you, grazie. Before, uh, before asking if there's any question raising in the public, I would like to give you a couple of practical information. One is that if you want to know more about the Great Animal Orchestra, uh, there is a dedicated book which is uh, uh, at the bookstore here. Uh, and uh, secondly is that uh, uh, at the end of the Q&A uh, session, if uh, any of you would like to visit the Great Animal Orchestra, you have free access and uh, uh, the visit will be guided by Bernie Krauss himself. Any question? <coughs> yes. Yes. It's actually a very short question. I was just wondering if actually also the plants can communicate through sound. I know that they don't, they cannot hear as we do, but probably they can use the sound just to communicate among. Uh, there's some research on that now, and the indications are yes, they do. Trees in particular. Uh, I have recordings of trees actually 
producing a signal that's not the wind in the leaves. Um, I have a recording of corn growing in the field uh, late one August night. Uh, so I do, I mean, I'm sure that there's some relationship and there's some uh, response to the ways in which the sound is produced and received, but I don't know what that is yet. It's a little early. As, as Nadia said and Almo have stated, um, this is a brand new field. The field is maybe 20 years old. And we're just discovering the language to, to express this work as we speak, as we sit here. I mean, this is all new stuff. Can I add a recent research that I just read this week? Um, uh, they found out that the plant can hear through the medium of the flower. So that when bees are approaching, they can hear the buzz of the bee. And so the flowers are going to produce the sweetest pollen. I want to add one more thing. I just, I just remembered. Um, there's a researcher by the name of Michel André. And Michel has discovered that he's in, in Barcelona. He discovered that noise pollution in the ocean is causing the kelp, the vegetation underwater, to release its grip from the, the, its roots from the bottom of the ocean and rise to the top and die. So it's certain kinds of noise pollution that are affecting the plants. And it's affecting whole kelp forests. And from the uh, Fondation Cartier side, uh, as, I, as I told at the very beginning, the next exhibition will be around trees. So I think that we're going to be more prepared next time the Biennale would like to invite us <laughs> for, for the next uh, subject. Starting in July 2000. Um, I just wondered if there's any prospect of using uh, this material or research uh, artificially to recreate sound habitats, or, or um, would that just create more sound pollution? Is it something that cannot be inseminated? Somebody already thought about it. I remember that when we were, me and Bernie, in Barabu, uh, there was a naturalist, Aldo Leopold, which has built a, a sort of checklist of the bird species from the first to sing in the morning to the last one. And they recreated, they recreated the sounds of all the species uh, all together, following the order that Aldo Leopold uh, indicated so the, in, in such a detailed manner. Manner. So um, there is the possibility, but it's always something that is useful for human, you know, but less for nature, probably. <laughs> the problem, and yes, we were at the same conference, and the problem that I had with that recording was that they put together this recording with all the birds that he notated. The problem was that the birds were taken from different habitats, so they all had different dialects. They, they weren't from Wisconsin. Yeah, they weren't from Wisconsin. And you never know when you're constructing these things at, um, in what sequence the birds are going to begin to vocalize. You have them all on paper, but you don't know the exact sequence. And you don't know the exact position that the birds are in in relationship to one another. So I know about these kinds of, of constructions, and I've tried to do some of them myself. but I. I think that in the end they don't work very well and when you introduce new species to, to habitats that haven't, well, where you think you can reconstruct the habitat, it often doesn't work. For instance, um, I, was in, I was working in Alaska in 2006 and I was working uh, uh, in the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is in the northeastern corner of Alaska on the Bering Sea. And one of the things that we found was that the American robin uh, had migrated like uh, uh, 300 kilometers north of its normal north range in uh, near Fairbanks, Alaska, which is about 67 degrees 
uh, north latitude. The problem was that, uh, first of all, the robins are uh, uh, very um, intensive, and they take over all the other territory, the other birds. Uh, and secondly, the Native American groups who lived in that area had never seen a robin before. They didn't even have a name for it. So you introduce the different, you, you try to introduce species in a habitat and hope that they'll survive. But the problem is, if the habitat has been abandoned by those species anyway, and the species are gone, there's going to, there's very strong reason to believe that it's not going to be successful. The reintroduction will not be successful. And anyway, why would you want to do that? The habitat has changed. So it'll, it'll be filled by new ones. Maybe. Hi. Uh, um, I will try to articulate uh, uh, my question in a better way possible. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested uh, uh, about uh, the um, uh, acoustic and the noise relation that the human has with the, the environment around uh, itself. It can be natural or uh, industrial organic, inorganic one, I don't care, but um, one thing that uh, thrilled in my mind when uh, you were talking about uh, for the various aspects of sounds that, I don't know, uh, birds uh, and uh, other species uh, can, uh, how can I say, uh, pull out, that uh, it reminded me uh, like uh, uh, Pandit Pranath, who uh, was uh, like a master in the Kirana style uh, music in India. In India, uh, he was uh, basing his uh, um, voice and uh, tonal voice uh, on the um, on the bird. So, um, since uh, every different bird has his own uh, particular tone scale, he was trying, you know, to uh, reach this kind of uh, uh, aspect, sound aspect, or like the lake has his own kind of uh, uh, sound, and he uh, took this thing. Uh, and used it as the tabla sound. I would like to understand what is your um, uh, relation with the objects, instruments, like a recorder, a common one, that uh, I don't know if you are uh, taking a, a raw material information, if you uh, manipulate them later, but um, uh, how how do you try to preserve uh, that uh, kind of uh, natural sound that you are collecting and trying later to take out? To I don't know, it can be uh, to represent something, to exhibit something. And I think that uh, uh, the representation uh, gives us another uh, argument, like the aesthetic one. And I think it's uh, very important because that's why I'm also curious later to see the um, exhibition, because uh, it may be interesting and, uh, how can I say, helpful for a certain kind of people, you know, to see the sound represented uh, and that, uh, because uh, in, in, in effect, uh, the, the sound as a, as a vibration, as a physical, you know, uh, movement, uh, it can be described and represented but I'm, uh, um, how can I say, uh, uh, I have a certain fear, uh, <laughs> based on the human condition, that uh, many people will, uh, uh, with this uh, aesthetic uh, representation, take care most of that instead of the sound, uh, how can I say, uh, articulation of it, uh, which is the balance that uh, you work on. Uh, these two purposes? That's a really great question, even if it is long. Yeah, sorry about <laughs> it. It's, it can be longer. That's okay. Um, my sense is of recording, as soon as we record something, we take it out of context. So it's immediately an abstraction. And then we take it and we cut it up into time. So these recordings 
that you hear in this exhibit uh, are 12 minutes long. The original they're taken from the original recording, but the original recording was maybe two hours or three hours long. I've taken a piece out of it that happened to be most representative, I thought, of that habitat. That's another abstract layer of abstract. And then you take it and you bring it into an environment like this. That's the third layer of abstraction. So you've taken it, you've immediately taken these, song, these sounds out of context. And then I forgot also, when you record with a microphone, every microphone has its own characteristic, its own pattern, its own, its own frequency response, its sensitivity to the field. Um, and there are different types, not only different types of microphones, but also different types of ways to record. Like there are five different stereo types of recording. So you've got all kinds of layers of stuff here, abstracted. What do you do with it? Well, for me, I'm trying to represent a sense of place. So that's key to me. So anything that helps represent that sense of place is what I do in terms of production. Most of these recordings uh, that you hear are simple recordings from one moment to another moment. The ocean recording that I have is, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a combination of many sounds. I have a lot of fish in there, for instance. People don't know that fish make sound. Uh, I have several different uh, forms of whales. Um, and I have a lot of bird sounds because it, the, the, the idea of that piece is, is a recording from the ocean shore, underwater, where you hear all the, the submarine uh, sounds and then back onto the surface again. So I've taken a lot of liberties with the imagery of that particular thing. I'm trying to construct a different kind of idea. So, yeah, uh, I mean, what does it mean to people? I don't know, each person is gonna to have to interpret that their own way because I have no obligation beyond what I deliver, uh, I think, you know, except to deliver good stuff. I have, I'd uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, we, we, will, we will need to allow another couple of questions, so please be uh, uh, This one is short. gonna be way shorter. Uh, no, yes, because uh, one thing that uh, also uh, matters to me, you know, at, is that if I imagine well, during this exhibition, we will have like a, a frontal visualization of the things. And uh, probably there's going to be like a 360, hmm, a three, hmm, 360 degrees sound, you know, uh, PA, but uh, it's still this kind of a frontal, uh, you know, visualization of thing. While you, uh, uh, meanwhile, when you register something, you have, uh, you, you are surrounded by this. Right. There is no, like, ex exactly. And um, what is your, uh, how can I say, um, opinion on this uh, matter that is uh, representing this uh, sound, not in the same way that, uh, like, you being there? My opinion is we do the best we can. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Say triste la vie d'artiste. <laughs> we're, always, we're always in trouble no matter what we do, so it's okay. A last question? Yeah, uh, if I can. Uh, just uh, to say that uh, we can record far field, near field. According to the scale that you use, you have a completely different uh, condition. So far field, you collect every information, the soundscape. And if you collect information near field, few meters around, you collect the local information. And often animals integrate near and far field to interpret the complexity exactly in the same way we are doing. So for threats, far field are important to understanding if something is coming, some animal is coming. And so or for local, searching for local food, you need local sounds for other individuals and not far sound for far individuals. 
So near and far field may make, makes the difference according to the representation. The human abstraction of the sound depends on your, uh, or your feeling. If you like an aesthetic or you try to select exactly one point for some reasons. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, that's absolutely right, Alno. And this material is presented in, in Dolby 7.1. So we've changed even the perspective of it. But you do get the near field, very present sound, and the mid field and the far field, because that's part of what it is that we want to do. We want to, we want to present a perspective. But the perspective isn't the same as we have in the wild. I mean, it just, you know, unless we're doing ambisonic and you're standing right smack in the middle of a presentation like that, you, you won't hear it. It just is not possible. One last question. Two little questions, one for Nadia and one for Benny. Can I? A sound designer and a sound artist, I'm trying to create an immersive room with the lights and the 360 degrees with a bisonic uh, material. For Nadia, you show us uh, that sound can uh, help to clean the pollution. I would like to see, in, uh, because I also uh, having a research that with the uh, specific frequencies we can construct pollution even in the sea. We would like to see in the know if it's a fake or if it's real. In the presentation, I was talking about the noise pollution effects on animals, not about uh, how to delay the noise from recording. Because unfortunately, uh, uh, animals cannot delay this kind of effect. And what I study is the effect of the noise on them. So uh, maybe I was misunderstood. I don't know. I can't hear your question. Sorry. You have a mic. And my question for Bernie is um, if you can uh, advise us, I mean, as a sound designer, which kind of uh, environment, ambience environment, uh, would be the best for human? I mean, in co working, try to uh, resampling uh, the degrees with the sonic. Uh, uh, environment for uh, uh, such as the dusk or uh, dawn in the trees uh, of uh, Europe or which uh, is your uh, advice for uh, for example a uh, work so we need to have calm we need to be focused well I think that it's something we ought to discuss individually after the program that it's not some it's not part of this discussion now okay I mean I'll talk with you after so now I think I have the feeling that we can stay and discuss all night long, but uh, the triennale will close. And if we want to visit the installation, this is the right moment. And we thank so much Bernie Kraus, Nadia Pieretti, Almo Farina for their presence and for their incredible contribution. <laughs>